Ephesians 5, looking at verses 15 to 33, the title of this message is, what does the Holy Spirit look like? What does the Holy Spirit look like? I, I, I'm asking this question because many of you came out of churches like I did, where there was a lot of bizarre things that went on in the church. Folks, you know, trying out for the track team, running around. <laughs> Others were trying for some, you know, acrobatic kind of thing, flipping off the pews and, you know, doing all. And, and, and then when you ask him, why, why did you do that? Well, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me. The Lord moved me. And so it came known that when something like that was going on, back off, don't you dare say anything in it, uh, against it because the Spirit of the Lord led me to do that. And I've seen, I've been around a long time and I've seen some bizarre things. So it's the purpose of the Spirit of God to come upon us is to enable us to do bizarre things at church. So I'm, I am a very practical person. If, if the Spirit of God is to come upon me, is to live within me, well, what would that look like? What would that enable or empower me to do? If I said the Spirit of God is in me, this is what this message is all about. Now, Christianity has been compared to a walk, a walk with God. We see Adam walked with God in the cool of the day in Genesis 3. Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. God told Abraham to walk before me in Genesis 17, walk before me and be blameless. David said in Psalm 23, verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil because you're with me. And then we know in Micah 6, 8, to uh, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. So we can see it's a walk. In the New Testament, we see it as well. Uh, it, it tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. So the, the life with God is a walk. It speaks of a continuous action. It speaks of our conduct of life. So now that we know that we are in a walk with God, yes, it's, we're in a relationship, but our relationship with him is compared to a walk. So the spirit of God is gonna empower us to live this life we can't live on our own, so what would it empower us to do? This is what we're about to see. Now. In um, Ephesians 5, and it says there in verse 2, it tells us to walk in love. And then in verse 8, it says walk in the light. Now in verse 15, it tells us, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Now, once again, walk. The Greek word is a peripatel, and, and it speaks of our conduct of life. Not just a walk on Sunday when we come to church. Not just a walk on Wednesdays when we come back midweek. No, it's our whole conduct of life. And so he says here, walk circumspectly. That Greek word means to walk very carefully. And so as we're walking, we just not haphazardly just kind of woo hoo 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 No, no, we're walking very carefully and, we, and we're watching. Jesus told us to watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. So as we're walking, we're walking, we should be walking carefully. Why? Not as fools, but as wise. Now, we know the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. We let the Bible define who are fools. In, in, in Psalm 14, 1, Psalm 53, 1, it said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So the fools are the unbelievers. They said that there is no God. So they're, they're unbelievers. Now, so he said that as we're walking carefully, let us not walk as the unbelievers. Not as fool, but as wise. We need to be wise as we're walking. Why? Notice what he said in verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Ex agorazo is the Greek word for redeem. It comes from ek, E-K, which means completely out of, and agorazo, it, it, it means to buy up the opportunity. Ex agorazo was used to describe buying a slave off the slave market. We know in the Roman Empire, there were over 60 million slaves during the days of Paul. And so slavery was something that was very known 
in this particular time. And so what people, a lot of people would do who are believers, they would go to the slave market and completely buy that slave off of the market. Ek, completely out of Ek and Agarazzo, completely out of the market. So Paul is using it metaphorically here to describe how we need to buy up the opportunities that we're walking among those who are fools or unbelievers. Why? He said, because the days are evil. I don't have to tell you that the days are evil. You're right next to DC. <laughs> days are evil. We got some tomfoolery going on. <clears throat> and here's the thing, because we know that, we need to be wise as we're walking. Redeeming the time, buying up every opportunity we have to be around unbelievers. Let me tell you something. This is why we are here as a church. No, Pastor Tony, I disagree. Well, we're here to worship God. We got all eternity to worship God. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a man about that word. We, we're here for the study of the word. We're going to sit at the feet of Jesus for all eternity. There's only one thing we can't do in heaven, and that is to win lost souls to Christ. That is the only thing we cannot do. All we have is now to win lost souls. So we need to buy up the opportunities we have to be around them. You would never win them if you're calling them names. You would never win them if you're looking down upon them. You would never win this world if you just, when you see them, you're like, oh, and them against us. You will never win them to the Lord. Never, ever win them to the Lord. As long as you look down upon them with your snootiness. You never win them. And this is the only time we have to win lost souls to Christ. What an opportunity you have. Okay. All right. So see then that you walk so circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days of evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Oh, I wish I had time to tell you how to know God's will for your life. Oh, if there's one question I'm asked more than any as a pastor, how can I know God's will for my life? Oh, I got, oh, oh that's a whole message. So if, if, if I'm gracious enough to come back again, <laughs> I would do that, that particular one. Okay, understand what the will of the Lord is. In short, I will say this connected to those verses, Understanding what the will of the Lord is, it's God's will that lost souls get saved. Second Peter 3, 9, God isn't willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Uh, first Peter, I mean, first Timothy uh, 2, verse uh, uh, 4 and 5, it says this. It says, God desire all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So God desires lost people to be saved. So you want to know what God's will is? Well, that right there, he desires lost people and he placed them all around you. Not for you to ignore them or become like Pharisees. The Pharisees, whenever they came upon or came close to a sinner, they would pull their coat and they, like, like they got the cooties or something. <laughs> it's not what we should be doing. We should be redeeming the time because the days are evil. Not like, oh, it's so bad out here. Yes, it's bad. It's bad. It's supposed to be bad. This is why we're here to win them to Christ. That's why we're here. That's why God is still saving souls here at our church. We're seeing the influx. I have a friend of mine I just talked to um, that has a, a, a church uh, about this size uh, in LA. He said, we've seen 1,500 people come to Christ this year alone. I said, whoa. Okay, I'm running out of time already, okay. Now, verse 18, verse 18 is where we kick off today's message. That, that was just an appetizer. You know, you, you go to a restaurant, you, you're going to go get an appetizer right after this. Okay, well, that, that was the appetizer. Now, here come the main course. 
and the conjunction and is connecting what was just said to what is about to be said. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. The word dissipation is asotia. The, the A at the beginning, a, means to, uh, without. And sotia, the root of that is sozo, where we get salvation from. So to put in the word together, ah, sotia, it means without salvation. Not salvation as in saving our souls, but without deliverance. He's saying don't be drunk with wine where you are like, you look like you're without salvation. Let me just pause here. I said this first service, I'm gonna say it here today. This second service. Some of you started back dabbling with alcohol again. When you were in that state before, you cried out for God to save you, and he did. But lately, within the last few years, you've been dabbling again. You're going back into that which God has delivered you from. And I'm just here to tell you the Lord loves you, but he sees you. I am the human voice of what he's been speaking in your heart. I'm, I'm it. And, and, and the Lord loves you. But this time, if you continue to go down this road, it's going to be worse this time around. You thought you almost lost your family last time. And I'm just here to say, hey, if that's you, the Lord loves you, but he, he wants to deliver you. He wants to set you free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But he wants you to know he sees you dabbling. You're back hiding bottles again. You're back tucking them places. And you've kind of just drifted back into that. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just here to speak a word to you. The Lord loves you, but he sees you. And he wants to deliver you from that. He really does. And I don't know who that was for, but you know who it's for. You got it. You, you hear me loud and clear. So it says, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. But notice, but be filled with the Spirit. I love that word filled. The Greek word is plerao. It's an amazing Greek word because different people will use plerao for different reasons. Uh, such as sailors would use plerao to describe how the wind will fill the sails of a boat and carry it to a destination, so too we are to allow the Spirit of God to fill the sails of our lives and carry us to the destination of becoming like Christ. The second use of plerao, uh, bakers, cooks, would use plerao to describe how salt permeates meat and gives it flavor, so too we should allow the Spirit of God to permeate our lives and give us the flavor of Christ. That when people come around us, they should be doing this. <laughs> well, it's something about you. You got a different flavor than what everybody else is having. See, and we have the flavor of Christ. This is why in Matthew 5, 13, it says, you are the salt of the earth. Because we should have a saltiness. So for you old sailors, you call old salts. There should be some saltiness, some, some history with God, some experience, some saltiness. And so that was the second use of the word plerao, used by cooks. The third use of the word plerao is what is used here. It speaks of total control. As alcohol totally controls the individual, so we should allow the Spirit of God to totally control our lives. And, and, and many of you know what it's like to be, under, to be totally controlled by alcohol. Many of you know what that's like. You can take a little shy little girl or woman and you pour alcohol in her, she's on top of the table, woo, just going for it. Because now alcohol is totally controlling her. Some of y'all just did that last week, huh? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that we should allow the Spirit of God to totally control our lives. Who's controlling your life today? As you look at your life, who's controlling it? 
Because what I'm about to say or how far I get into what I'm about to say is not even possible unless you're filled with the Spirit. You have to be filled and powered. The word power, uh, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The word power there is deutimus, is where we get dynamite, dynamic from. You need the dynamic power of God's Spirit to even do what I'm about to do. Well, do what I'm about to say. Now, here's the thing. What does the Holy Spirit look like? If, if I'm filled with the Spirit of God, would it have me running around, doing flips? Would it have me swinging off the lights up here? What, what would the Spirit of God? Okay, what we're about to see is what the Spirit of God would enable us to do as individuals. Look at verses 19 through 21. It says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and submitting to one another in the fear of God. The first thing we will see when we're filled with the Spirit of God is that worship will become meaningful for us. You see that in verse 19. Speaking to one another in Psalms, Psalms, you know, the book of Psalms was the hymn book for the nation of Israel. Psalms and hymns, those songs that's been handed down through history, through Christian history. Spiritual songs, those songs that can't, they were birthed out of hurt. They were birthed out of uh, tribulation and trials. Those are those particular songs, spiritual songs. And it says, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. When you're filled with the Spirit of God, worship is, is meaningful. You, you, you want to sit down front. You're, you can't wait for the worship to start. Now, we understand worship is not a, a, a genre. It's a lifestyle. We understand that. But for the sake of the conversation, worship is just meaningful for you. You always got a, a, a Christian song on your heart. You, you're not always singing about, oh, I lost my dog. And I just, you're not, uh, no. No, it's Lord, I lift your ha- name on high. I love to sing your praises. And you're lifting up hands and you're in the car or you're at home and you, just, you got a song. When you're filled with the Spirit of God, worship is meaningful for you. Worship is not this thing, you know, hey, we can get that late. You know, all they're doing for 25 minutes is singing those songs, you know. As long as we're there for the word. And you fail to realize that those songs prepare you to hear the word. That it is a monologue that we are supposed to have with God and not just, a, 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 it's a dialogue that we should have with God, not just a monologue, should I say. And so often when you come and you come just for the word, you missed out on starting the conversation with God through worship. See, when we expose ourselves to God, God who is light, 1 John 1, 5, God who is light, when we expose ourselves to light, he shines a spotlight upon the darkness in our lives. He began to show us how uh, that anger that we have, that bitterness towards someone, that unforgiveness that we're holding. He began to show us all those things because now here we are, God who is light is shining the light on the dark areas of our lives. And then we're like, oh, Lord, please forgive me. I'm sorry. Lord. Oh, you know, and you're angry at the person sitting next to you. And oh, Lord, you know, and you hit them, kind of hit them. Just like, oh, I'm sorry. And, you know, and all that is going on through worship. And then when your, your pastor or your pastor's sons get up here and open up the word, Hey, you are ready to receive because God has exposed the darkness in your life. You're ready to receive the word of God. You spoke to God through worship. He speaks now to you through the word. And you've had a dialogue and not a monologue. This is what happens when you come and say, you know, they just singing those songs. And then you come when the word is opened up because you didn't open up that dialogue through worship, you get the word when you hear something you don't agree with. I don't agree with that. Or all of a sudden you want to become lovey-dovey with the person next to you. But when you open yourself up to the word first by worshiping the God that we came to worship, then whatever he has to say, Even before he says it, we're like, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. This is what it's all about. So worship becomes meaningful for you. All of a sudden, sudden, secondly, 
You know you're filled with the Spirit when you're filled with thanksgiving. A lot of people want to know, what is God's will for my life? Well, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says it's God's will that we give thanks. God wants us to be thankful people. He, go, he wants us to be filled with gratitude. Nothing is worse than ingratitude now from my grandchildren. Here you go. Hey, say thank you to Papa. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I'm mad now. Little busters. <laughs> just take what I have and just off, off the run. I said, hey, come back here. Say thank you. My, my little twins, the youngest one, they're, they're like two, almost three. Got to teach these babies. And because we get upset with ingratitude. In and so God wants us to be thankful. And so when you're filled with the Spirit, you, you, you see things and you're like, oh, I was upset at that bad traffic out there on Tyson Corner. But, uh, <laughs> but Lord, now I see you are protecting me from an accident right here. And see, you begin to see God and begin to be thankful for the things that he's done that he's allowed to come into your lives and stuff. Many people talk about me because I talk about the Marine Corps so much, my family. But see, I'm, th I'm thankful. Now, when I was in, I was ready to get out. <laughs> but now looking back, I see what that training in the Marine Corps did for me now as an adult. And I'm thankful. So when you're filled with the Spirit, you not only have a song on your heart and worship is meaningful, but you're thankful. The third thing we see what happened in us personally is verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Submitting there is hupotasso. Hupo means under, tasso means authority. It's submitting one to another in the fear, phobos, where we get phobias from, in the fear of God. So meaning that we're going to be held accountable and because we're going to help stand before God and be held accountable, there's a fear that we will submit to because we want to please God when we stand before him. And therefore, it says submitting one to another in the fear of God, meaning that God is watching. And last time I checked, verse 21 comes before verse 22. I think uh, somebody... <laughs> Any old body off the street can quote verse 22. Why be submissive to your husbands? But verse 21 comes before verse 22, submitting one to another in the fear of God. This is beautiful here. So we see here that when we're filled with the Spirit, worship is meaningful that we will be get, given thanks, we're thankful. There's a humility, we're submitting one to another. There's a humility about us. Now, what would the Holy Spirit look like when we take him, when we take him home? Verse 22. <laughs> Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Oh, can, can we start right there? Wives, submit. Submit is hupotasso. Now, once again, we already explained what hupo tasso means. It means, it, it means hupo is under and tasso means authority. It's to place yourself under authority of another. It has nothing to do with superiority or inferiority. It has to do with order. Because the person, whoever it is, sitting in the White House, I am to submit to their authority. Why? Because as a Marine, that's my commander in chief. And therefore, he puts on his pants one leg at a time, just like I do. He's no more of a man than I am. But because of his authority and position, I'm going to submit myself under his authority. That's hupotasso. Your husband is no more of a human than you are. Even though sometimes we are terrible humans when we are as husbands. But that's another, that's another sermon. <laughs> so, <laughs> but... Because of the position God has given them in the home, you're to submit yourself under his authority. It has nothing to do with superiority or inferiority. It has to do with order. In order for there to be structure, it has to be order. Order. And so he says, submit, notice, to your own husband. There are more women who are more submissive to their bosses than their husbands. 
Well, Sally, I need you to stay a little longer today uh, because, uh, you know, guys, we got deadlines to meet. Okay, yes, boss, whatever you need, boss. Okay, okay. Ring, ring, ring. Honey, uh, I, the boss wants me to stay late, and, and you know, I just got to stay late and everything. And, and then he, you get home. You're in the kitchen, and all of a sudden the husband, <laughs> husband honey, can you, can you bring me a sandwich? I only got two hands. What's wrong with your legs here? What's wrong with you? I've been working all day. Come get it yourself. I, I, I just wanted a sandwich. <laughs> no, to submit to your own husband. I'm talking about the one you walked down the aisle and said, I do. I'm talking about the one that's busting his hump to make sure a roof is over your head. I'm talking about the one, I'm looking at some of you out here, the one not only has given you your children, he's giving you your grandchildren, and I'm looking at some of you, your great-grandchildren. That dude that we're talking about submitting to, submitting to your own husband. Oh, yes, we can be a jerk, and we can be a knucklehead, and yes, we can be involved in all sorts of tomfoolery. Yes. But notice... Says, submit to your own husband. And watch the last part. As to the Lord. Meaning part of what you're going to give an account to God is how you submit it to him. And can I just help you with something really quick? Many of you believe that submission is doing what you agree that your husband is saying. Whatever he's saying you agree with, that's submission. And many of you say, I'm very submissive. I, I do what, you know. My husband wants me to do. Yeah, as long as you agree with it. Submission, biblical submission is doing it when you don't agree. Oh boy, I, let, I, I dropped some gold at some of y'all's feet. Y'all didn't get it. Some of y'all will get it when you get in your car, but, but, but you didn't get it. <laughs> you think you're submissive because you agree with what your husband is saying. No, submission is doing it when you don't agree. Oh, that's okay. Well, we'll let that pill go down slowly. That was a multivitamin. <laughs> you know the one that gets stuck in the throat? <sighs> that's okay. That's all right. It's still true. We, you know, it's just kind of stuck. Just drink a little more water. It, it, it'll get down. It'll get down. Now, it says, for the husband is the head of the wife. Uh, as also Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject, subject, hupotasso, same Greek word. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, let me describe that prepositional phrase, in everything. It means in everything in accordance to the word of God. If he is asking you to do something unethical, unbiblical, that will bring harm to you or the children, you tell him to kick rocks and, and tell him, I'm not submitting to you because you're being a jerk right now. I'm not doing that. But if he's not asking you to do something that's unbiblical, you know, all those things, then you submit to him. It's not difficult. You can't do this without being filled with the Spirit. It's impossible. This is taking the Holy Spirit home. We all, quote, unquote, have the Holy Spirit in church. No. Oh. But we got to take the Holy Spirit to the house. This is what it looks like at home. And I only have, I, I promise to get past verse 26 this time, but I don't know if I'm going to make it. But we're going to see. We're gonna see. Uh, verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Husbands, love your wives. Agapeo or agape is that word. It's that divine love, that love that can only come from God, love with no strings attached, love unconditionally. This word was not a part of the classical Greek language until the apostles introduced it. Because this love describes uh, God's love, something the Greeks knew nothing about. So this is the type of love. Because, see, we have to have this uh, definition because many men think, well, I love you, honey. And the first thing we start describing, I provide a roof over your head, and I've done this, and I make sure the bills are paid. And now, well, we don't get to define how to love our wives. Notice, notice it says, husbands, love your wives just as. Ah, there it is. There it is. 
It doesn't give us room to come up with our own definition. It says, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, here's the thing. Just as, well, Christ loved us unconditionally and he loved us sacrificially. Unconditionally, he, he loved us, no strings attached. He didn't say, well, you go, hey, if I go to the cross, then you got to do something yeah, you, for me. No, no, he loved us unconditionally, but he loved us sacrificially as well. And that's how we're called to love our wives. Many men, they both, well, I'm willing to lay down my life for my wife. You can't even lay down your phone for your wife, <laughs> let alone lay down your life. Cut it out. You can't do that at all. But this is how we're called to love our wife just as Christ loved the church. We can't do this, man, without being filled with the Spirit. We can't. And as the clock ticks away, <laughs> verse 26, where I left off first service, <laughs> that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. Now, we know as your pastor is up here faithfully teaching you the word of God from Genesis to Revelation and his sons are following behind him. As you're here being taught the word, God is washing his people, washing you his people with the water of the word. He's washing you. All the filth you brought in from the world and all that, he's washing you. He's washing you. So we're called to wash our wives with the word of God. Now, for many people, they think, well, all right, honey, let's sit down. We're going to read the Bible together. And that has its place. I, don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking that. That has its place. Well, honey, and uh, the Hebrew word here, uh, that's, that, that's, that's, that's fine. But that's not what it's talked about here. That's logos. Washing her by the water of the logos. Logos is the written word. That's not the word here. The Greek word is rhema. When I found that out, I said, oh, rhema is a prophetic word, meaning that you're in touch with God as a husband so much that when you're, you are around your wife, you can just speak a word into her life. You know what's going on with it because you know how women want us to be mind readers and all this kind of stuff and read their, you know, emotions, all that kind of, they want us to do all that. But hey, when you're in touch with God, you will have a rhema word for her that will blow her out of the water. That you will be washing her with the water of the word, the rhema word. Nothing is wrong with the logos word sitting down and saying, honey, let's read through the book of Ephesians. Nothing's wrong with that. But that's not the word that's used here, not logos, it's rhema. That prophetic word spoken, that would mean you need to be in the word yourself, husbands. You got to be in the word yourself. That's all I got time for. Doggone it, I tried it, I tried again, third service. <laughs> Oh, Father, we are so grateful for your great love for us. Lord, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. We need you. We love you because you first loved us. You demonstrated your love by going to Calvary's cross to die for us. Lord, if there's anyone here who has not repented of their sin and accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, may you draw them to you today. Draw them to the foot of the cross. Draw them to you. Oh, God, we need you. We can't do this. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, empower us to be husbands. Empower us, uh, the ladies, to be wives. Lord, empower us to be your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.